Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Dumit. I'm the director of the Institute for Social Sciences and a professor in anthropology and science and technology studies. And this talk is also co-sponsored by the Data Science Initiative. Duncan Temple Lang is in the back. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to our lecture today. ISS hosts and supports a broad range of events as part of its mission to promote the social science researches on campus at UC Davis. To stay up to date on these and other events, um, please check out our ISS website and look at our uh, weekly newsletter. And we're on Facebook and Twitter. And the Data Science Initiative aims to foster, catalyze, coordinate, and promote research and education related to data science and big data on campus. To that end, it serves as a hub of activity related to the entire data pipeline, including data acquisition, statistical and machine learning, technology developments, visualization, interdisciplinary data-related research and education. And it has a weekly series of events you can find on its website, uh, datascience.ucdavis.edu. Our speaker this afternoon is Carter Butts who's a professor in the Department of Sociology, Statistics, and EECS, and the Institute for Mathematical Behavioral Sciences at UC Irvine. Butts joined the UCI faculty in 2002 after receiving his PhD from the Department of Social and Decision Sciences at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he currently serves as area editor for the journal Computational and Mathematical Organization Theory and serves in the editorial board of the Journal of Mathematical Sociology. Butts' research involves the development and application of mathematical, computational, and statistical techniques to theoretical and methodological problems within the areas of social and biological network analysis, mathematical sociology, quantitative methodology, and human judgment and decision making. As he presents a lecture entitled From Conversation to Plant Carnivory, Using Data Science to Tackle Complex Systems, please join me in welcoming Carter Butts. Well, thanks to, uh, first of all, thanks to, uh, to all of you for coming out today. I'm excited to uh, come uh, visit you folks. A lot of exciting stuff is going on here, and uh, it's fun to, uh, to learn about that and also to share with you a little bit of the, the stuff that, uh, that uh, my group and the collaborators are uh, working on at uh, UCI. Um, as the title indicates, uh, this is going to be uh, a little of everything. I know I have a diverse crowd, so hopefully um, there will be uh, something here that, uh, that uh, whets your uh, appetite, whether you're uh, more interested in social networks or more interested in, in uh, uh, bioinformatics or uh, whatever else. So uh, to get started, um, I begin by noting the thing that in a sense brings us all here today, um, um, other than the University of California, of course. Um, and that is, uh, that is uh, uh, the revolution that we're all uh, very aware of in computation over the last you know, 50, 60 years or so. Um, and so um, obviously we're all very aware of the extent to which um, this uh, period has completely transformed our ability to process, store, gather, and transmit uh, data. And this has led to a real uh, revolution in uh, throughout the sciences. Uh, and that's manifested in a lot of different areas, the um, uh, rise of computational science, if you like, um, the uh, you know, growing developments in computational statistics, machine learning, AI, and then, of course, this amalgam that has come to be called data science, um, and as well as in our capacity to collect, maintain, and uh, store and share data itself, so the sort of cyber infrastructure that allows that to happen at scale. And so there are many, many exciting developments coming out of that uh, that are affecting people throughout uh, throughout the sciences and, and computer science. Um, but one aspect of this that I find particularly exciting is that we're, um, we're increasingly able to take very complex systems uh, in the social world, the biological world, and the like, and study them in a way that is on the one hand empirically rigorous, okay, building models that actually have a statistical foundation, um, we can really link to data, models that can be wrong, right? we can falsify them, get rid of them, unlike some of the old school agent-based models that we used to do. Um, but that also um, capture the, uh, what we think of as the critical mechanisms um, and complexities behind those systems. Okay? So they don't oversimplify too much, at least, um, in the process of doing that. And, um, certainly for me, uh, trying to um, uh, pursue these sorts of questions, I think that's a very um, exciting uh, development. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to build on that theme, uh, and there are going to be kind of three general um, sort of thrusts that I will um, say some things in, and these are all sort of things that lots of people are doing, and so what I'll talk about are just some specific things that we've done in these areas. So the first 
um, we'll talk about how we can use advances in, in computational and statistical techniques to model uh, interaction dynamics um, in, you know, from real world data uh, in a realistic way. Um, I'll talk a bit about online behavior um, as a, um, a site for social research and also in a, an area where we want to understand more about how people do things so as to guide practice. Um, and I'll talk about that in the context of online behavior and disasters. Um, and then finally, I'll um, say a bit about some more recent stuff that, uh, that I and some collaborators have been doing, trying to, um, to exploit some of the advances in bioinformatics and molecular modeling to um, utilize the giant trove of genomic data that's out there to identify useful uh, biomolecules um, without having to laboriously make each one in the lab, um, which is especially important for me because I can't make any of them in the lab. So I'll see a bit about each of these things. So I'm going to start um, with conversation. I'm going to begin uh, at the beginning with interaction. And um, to, uh, to say a bit about, about the, the approach I'm going to take, I'm going to actually start with the approach I'm, I'm not going to take, but sort of, sort of where I come from. Right? So I'm fundamentally a networker. That's my big uh, focus. And in the social network or general network science world, right, we think about um, networks, even dynamically, as in terms of temporally extensive relationships. Right? So if you have two people and say they have a friendship with each other, that friendship might be uh, perhaps short-lived, but it has some duration. Right? You form the friendship, it goes on for some time, it ends. And even if the network is dynamic, right, that duration of those friendships is very important because it creates the opportunity for concurrency, for overlap, um, which has all kinds of consequences for how the network works and how things, say, diffuse on the network and so forth. And that's a very powerful approach. We can do lots of great stuff with it. But it's not always ideal, uh, because in some cases, we're dealing with phenomena that are really not so well characterized by an ongoing relationship as much as they are by a series of interactions. And so if we want to understand the social action that, um, that lies beneath the relationships in the give and take of, uh, of individuals, we need a different way to uh, think about it. Um, and so I came to this um, specifically from the work that I uh, was doing some years ago on the World Trade Center disaster. Um, and uh, specifically, what we were looking at was radio communication among individuals who were responding to the WTC disaster. So, you know, you go to work one day and uh, you're in the building going about your business and a plane hits your building and the building catches fire. It's going to be a bad day. Um, but you have to do something, right? When disaster strikes, people do not simply sit there and wait for help. They mobilize, they try to find out what's going on, they try to make contact with other people that they know, they try to figure out what actions should we take, can we take actions, who needs help, how do we help them, where do we go, let's get to a collection point, so forth. They mobilize to solve problems and, um, and, and save themselves and others, and the people in the WTC were, were no exception to that. Um, and so what we were able to do is we were able to secure uh, data or, well, materials originally on this event um, in the form of transcripts of radio communications among responders at the WTC and related um, sites. And this is, these originally, it literally was a stack of documents, you know, on this old-fashioned thing called paper, um, which were pried from the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey by a FOIA um, filed by the New York Times. And so we got this stuff and are figuring out how can we use this to get insight into this you know, hideously complex event. Um, and being networkers, we said, okay, what we can do is we can identify all of the people who are communicating with each other and we can start to build networks of who talked to whom uh, during the unfolding event. And that led to uh, networks like the one you see here. Um, uh, the, uh, this is a network which is, um, Well, I'll just wave at it. I prefer to do that anyway. The camera may or may not like it, depending, but <coughs> since it's quite small. Okay, so these are um, operations personnel at the WTC. Each node is an individual. Okay, there's an arrow from I to J. If I called J on the radio during this period, and this I should mention is, um, was work with my now former students, Marina Petrescu Popova, who's now at the University of Washington, and, and uh, Remy Cross, who's now at Webster. Um, and so we coded out networks for um, 17 different groups of responders. Um, and in studying them in this sort of classical network analytic way, we learned a lot of useful things. So we learned, for instance, that when we compared the networks formed by specialist responders of police and security to those who were non-specialists, say elevator operators, maintenance personnel, they had very similar structures in a lot of ways. We found that the networks were highly hub dominated. And if we looked at who wound up in these critical coordinator positions, they were most of the time people who did not have a pre-emergency 
um, a coordinative role. So we learned a lot about what went on in these networks, and yet it wasn't totally satisfying. Okay, because by flattening the whole interaction into this network, we were losing the uh, mechanisms behind uh, the high and thank you, that emergent structure. Right? We weren't able to see how the network uh, 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 comes about in, in the first place, and we were interested in getting at that. And so to do that, we needed to unpack the data and kind of think about it in a, a more, uh, in a way that was a little closer to, to what the original data uh, was about. And so here's an example. This is, um, this is one of our networks. This is um, personnel who were responders at Newark Airport. They were trying to close down the airport in the aftermath of the attacks. Um, this is our sort of conventional representation. So we flattened in time everyone's communication, and we can uh, we can sort of see there are these two hubs that hold most of the interaction, um, and then there are some various side conversations. But what you see on the right here, this is really what's going on. So this is the actual structure of the communication events where one person calls another through the network. And you can see, even just by eyeball, the, a lot of stru temporal structure here. You can see the back and forth of individual communications. You can see people going and switching between communication partners. Um, you can see new threads of communication popping up. You can see intermittent exchanges and so forth. And what we wanted to learn was, well, what are the things that drive this kind of stuff? And how do we, how do we think about this kind of data? Because it's really not so much um, a, a representation of ongoing um, relationships that we want. It's these relational events, as we came to call them. Okay, so what's a relational event? A relational event is a discrete event in which one or more uh, social entities, in that case we're talking about individuals, although they don't have to be, um, emit some behavior at one or more entities in their environment. So for instance, I might wave at you, okay, I might call you on the radio, or, or whatever else. And so we can think about representing these as just as with a, an edge in a network, we might represent it by a, 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 a dyad, right, a sender and a receiver. Here we can think about this by uh, a sort of portable, uh, where we have the sender of the event, the receiver of the event, um, there might be different kinds of events, okay, so there could be different sorts of things going on, which might have an action or a category type, and then finally some point at which the event occurs. And this is really the key thing that differentiates it from we usually do a network analysis, because usually, right, with networks, we're thinking about ties as existing for some period of time. Here, the approximation we're using is that the event is uh, essentially instantaneous. So that is, and of course, nothing is truly instantaneous, but what we mean is that that actual communication or interaction event itself is very short compared to the overall time scale of the dynamics, okay? So they're not, uh, they don't tend to be coterminous in time. And looking at the world that way, um, uh, turn, leads to something that, that's quite different. Um, so now, given that we have these interactions, of course, one interaction alone is not very exciting, okay? They're exciting because these actions work together in event histories, they're back and forth um, between different individuals, or sometimes individuals and whole groups, as for instance, as I talk to you now, an event from me to you as a collective. And so we can consider here, I'm going to represent this by this A sub, well, big A sub T, um, the set of all actions that occur in some time, from some zero that we define arbitrarily to when we stop observing some time T. And that's our event history. Um, at each moment in that event history, of course, there's a set of things that people might do, okay, which we represent by there, this um, uh, bold A. And that, of course, is going to be a subset of the Cartesian product by all of the possible senders, by all the possible receivers, by all the things they might do. And, uh, of course, that itself could be um, something that's endogenous to what's happened before. So sometimes, in fact, an action you take might make new actions possible or inhibit it. Um, so, for instance, uh, if you want to drive a car, right, you can't drive the car until you get in the car. Um, you can't get in the car until you open the door unless it's Dukes of Hazard and you go through the window. Um, but so, uh, in, in some cases, that's important. Um, in modeling this, we make a number of assumptions. So um, it's certainly what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to assume it's a finite set um, and constant between actions. Um, and, and often this is fixed, but you know, it doesn't have to be. So our goal in practice is going to be given data on this set of events, A sub T. Uh, we want to model that, and we're going to do it by treating actions as events arising in continuous time, um, whose hazards depend upon the past history of what's happened up till now, and possibly things like covariance. Um, and so there are various ways you could think about uh, doing that, and sort of here's the main development that we use, um, and uh, the what we call the relational event framework. So the basic idea is pretty straightforward. We're going to uh, take the propensities of events to occur, or people to take actions. Um, we're going to model that by a hazard function. 
And the idea is that the log hazard function is going to be a linear combination of these functions u that are going to encode the, propen the things that drive action propensity. And these are relatively arbitrary functions of who would be sending the event, who would be receiving the event, what kind of event it would be, stuff that's happened in the past, and, um, and covariance. And so for some of you are familiar with sort of an ergum framework. These act like the sufficient statistics in an ergum, right, in that they encode the different kinds of things that might shape uh, action and interaction. Um, then I'm going to introduce a simplifying assumption. You can relax this assumption. Um, I'm not going to today. Um, it isn't that, uh, that hard to mess with, but uh, makes life easy. I'm going to assume that hazards are constant between events. So when something, any time an event happens, it may change everyone's propensity to act in a complex way, but we're going to assume that the propensities don't change until something occurs, and then of course they may change again, and then something happens and they change again. Um, if you introduce that assumption, then it turns out you can write down the likelihood for an entire event history, and it looks like this um, uh, lovely equation here. And if any of you are aficionados of, it goes by different names in different fields, event history analysis or survival analysis or hazard analysis, um, this will look pretty familiar um, uh, as a typical likelihood for an event sequence. Um, if you're not, it will look like a bunch of products and exponentiated stuff. But let me just tell you the basic intuition is it's pretty straightforward. Um, all this says is that we can write down the likelihood of the event sequence in terms of a product over all the events that happen. In each case, the likelihood has two parts. One says you wait for the next event to happen. So this is the chance that nothing happens until it happens. Then a thing happens. And this is the chance of the thing that happened happening, as opposed to the other thing that could have happened but didn't. OK, then you wait for the next event. That's the chance of you have to wait till the next thing hap that happens happens. Then it happens. Now this is the thing that happened. And then after all the events have happened, you have to wait until the end of your observation time and nothing else happened. Then that was the chance that nothing would happen until you stop watching. So that's actually all that sort of says. Um, so the nice thing is we can write it down. It's pretty straightforward. We can usually compute it pretty easily. And so you know, now we're in a pretty simple world, right? We've written down a likelihood. All of our usual favorite tools of likelihood-based inference rise to the challenge, and we're in a very well-understood kind of situation. Now there's really nothing very special about it. We can proceed to do inference by maximum likelihood if we like, or we can be good people and proceed in a Bayesian manner. Um, putting a prior on theta, um, and we can do map, or we can do posterior simulation. And basically, at this stage, we can sort of turn the crank. Um, it's nothing super special. Uh, there are some computational challenges that get interesting. I'm not going to talk too much about that today, but I'm happy to talk about it later if people are interested. When the possible event set is large, and so there are some Monte Carlo tricks to deal with it. But for those of you who are familiar with the challenges of, say, ergon modeling, this is, by comparison, way, way easier. Okay, so the computational challenges are much, much simpler than they are in that setting, which is a very refreshing thing for those of us who spend a lot of time trying to make that work. Although, you know, it means there are not as many papers to be written about making it work, so I guess it's a bit of a trade-off. Okay, so having hung the proverbial gun on the wall, we should use it. So what can we do with this cool stuff? We uh, used it to model the World Trade Center disaster. We've used it to model conversation classrooms um, and other things. But um, I'm going to talk a bit now about one particular application, um, and this is joint work with uh, my colleague Corey Smith at, at Irvine, and then our um, now um, former student Chris Dubois, who's now at Apple, um, on trying to use this framework to capture latent interaction roles. Okay, and so this is building on a really classic fundamental intuition in social theory, and that is that when you have people um, and out there in the world interacting, their interactions are structured by roles, right? You have a particular kind of role, and that tells you, in essence, who you're supposed to interact with and how you're supposed to interact with them. It gives you, in a sense, a set of kind of uh, rules or heuristics that you use to get through the day. And the idea is that we all have these roles, we occupy them, and that affects how we interact with others, okay? And this is a deep article of faith that these things are out there. Um, not always an article, perhaps, of empirical uh, research. Um, so finding these roles has been a priority for social science for a long time. And certainly in the network community, this has been a longstanding um, interest. And there's a whole body of work on role analysis, going back, of course, to the classic Lorraine and White structural equivalence work, uh, Everett's work on automorphic equivalence, later work on uh, uh, regular equivalences, um, and then generalized block models. This has gotten picked up in the literature on stochastic block models, um, which has, uh, has taken off um, now uh, more in the statistical literature. Um, so there's just a whole lot of work on this, and networks of trying to find, explain the network in terms of these blocks 
of nodes that interact in particular ways. But that's all for a sort of network structure, a static structure. And that's not exactly interaction rules. If you go back to the theory, you're really talking about rules that govern how you would behave, how you would act if things occurred, right? And so what we really would like to do is be able to go into an interaction sequence and find sets of nodes that have differential patterns of interaction with respect to each other. Okay, and that's really what we want to get at. And that's not necessarily something that's going to crop out, like say, in a stochastic block model, just as a function of the interaction rates. And so here's just a, a, a toy example to sort of illustrate the point. And so here I have two different cases. This is synthetic data uh, where I have two different groups, A and B. Each, uh, this is a, a flattened sort of adjacency matrix. So I've taken the groups, they've interacted in time, and I've colored each cell by, for each node, the uh, volume of its interaction with the other nodes. Um, and so darker means there was more interaction between uh, the different nodes. And if we're lucky and we uh, wind up in what we'll call this rate differentiated case, then if we looked at this thing and say, ah, well, we've got these two groups and we can distinguish them because group A interacts more with itself than B and B interacts more with itself than A. Okay, and that's our kind of classic situation, right, for identifying um, role structure. And if, there's, if we're in that kind of world, this is well studied. Okay, we can use all of our favorite kinds of uh, methods for dealing with block densities um, uh, to, to prop, pull that out, right? And that's really, there are a lot of variants on it, but that's really what a lot of the standard techniques are, are going for at the end of the day. Finding these blocks that have, uh, that have high or low inter overall interaction rate. But the world might not be that simple. Okay, what if what differentiates these groups is not the total volume of interaction that they have with each other, but how they interact? So here's a second group. There also, there's an A and a B under here, but you really can't see much from the rates. Okay, the rates are not what differentiates them. Okay. So what does differentiate them? How could you possibly identify that? Well, in this case, the key thing that differentiates them is not how much they interact, but how they interact. And in particular here, it has to do with their rate, the rates at which they reciprocate each other. So it turns out that in this particular case, the A's and the B's each will, if they get another communication from an A or a B, they will quickly tend to reciprocate that. They'll immediately tend to reciprocate that interaction. But if, the, if an, another person from the other group contacts them, well, you know, they can sit and spend for a while. Um, and actually, you can see the, the, uh, uh, the B's are a little more attentive about responding to A's than the A's are to B's. So there's some asymmetry there, okay, in this case. But it's not manifest in the, in the race. And this, this is the kind of thing that we think happens in the real world, right? You have groups that say, I have to be deferential to you. Okay, so if you say something, I have to react to it. If there's this other group and, you know, I'm above you socially, well, whatever. I can blow you off. I don't have to attend to you. Okay, that's the kind of thing that we want to be able to detect. And so the question is, how do we do that? And we can use this relational event framework with a little extension um, to, to do exactly that. And so here's how we went about it. Um, what we said is, well, okay, we can, one way to think about this, um, this kind of latent role structure is that if we have interactions that would be between blocks um, of nodes, or these latent blocks of nodes, um, the, uh, the parameters that govern those interactions may be different from one block to another. And so we take our same model, so this is the same um, hazard function I showed before, just uh, taking the log of it. Um, and the idea is that instead of just having this theta times u, I'm going to let the theta here be specific to the pairs of the groups that are interacting. And so we have this latent variable z for the individual. Um, and so depending on this, what group z the, uh, the sender would be in versus the receiver, that's going to determine then the parameters that govern that interaction. So that, for instance, might put how much weight do I put on a quickly responding to you okay, versus not. Um, and so given that framework, um, we can then um, just simply put a uh, prior structure on Z and theta, and so here we just use a fairly straightforward kind of hierarchical Gaussian prior for the thetas, um, and we put a Dirac like, process prior on the Zs. You could use other choices. This is what we did here, um, and then we can um, we can do posterior simulation by MCMC and find this, and we use pretty sort of standard MCMC strategy to, to do this. And so then the question we might uh, ask is if we have this sort of framework and we apply it to, to data, do we see things that really look like um, there are these latent roles that are interesting, or, or is it really just, you know, it's all rates? So here's an example. Uh, we applied this to a, a sort of fairly standard off-the-shelf email data set from Ekman et al. Um, 80 individuals in the university. The, um, here we have uh, uh, 3,300 messages. We fit to the first 2,000 of them. Um, and we put terms in the model that represent things like the overall communication volume, 
um, corrections for sort of overall ingoing and outgoing volumes, how attractive people are, how much they send email to everybody else, um, and um, dyadic interactions. And it also affects here, these are, um, these are what are called P-shift effects, which is a, um, an idea based on David Gibson's work on conversation dynamics that reflect tendencies to, um, to immediately reciprocate or, or, or take a particular kind of action when you get a message. And so A, B, B, A is a tendency that if A sends something to B, B will immediately send something back to them. Um, a, B, A, Y says if A sends something to B, um, uh, then A will immediately, before B can do anything, A is going to send something to someone else. So this is a tendency to have sort of immediate, quick, serial communication. And then A, B, B, Y says A sends something to B. B is now going to pass it, immediately pass the baton to someone else. And so these represent different ways you can have um, uh, interactions conversationally. Um, and so we apply this to, uh, to our data. This is sort of what we get. So we sorted the data here by the, uh, by the estimated groups. Um, here is just the matrix of observed accounts, and then this is a, these uh, panels are zoom-ins of the little red panel here. Um, so you see, if you just look at the observed counts, you don't immediately um, see much, but under the hood, there's actually a lot going on. Um, and so if we look at, for instance, just our intercept estimates, these are just the baseline interactions. I've zoomed in on these two groups um, that we've identified here, and you can see on the one hand, as we might expect, we do see baseline tendencies uh, that are different for interaction. But on top of that, we do also see differences in how the groups interact. Um, so for instance, um, these are ABBA estimates. They have to do with immediate reciprocation. And we find actually it, um, in this case, the first group does not tend to reciprocate to itself very readily, okay, while, um, while it will reciprocate more in cross-group uh, communication, whereas B actually reciprocates fairly readily to itself. Um, there's also asymmetries between the groups. So for instance, the second group is very likely to relay on communication when members of the first group communicate with them, but the first group is not going to relay anything else. Um, so that first group starts to sound a lot like faculty when you really look at it. They're not attentive and not relaying anything, not responding to anyone. Um, so you happen to be familiar with, with people like that. Um, there you go. So, you know. So we do really see evidence of, uh, of role structure out there. Um, we might ask, of course, does this model predict anything? And you know, the good news is it does. We um, applied this to a number of different data sets. And um, I'm not going to go into depth on it just in the interest of time. But if you compare um, performance on held out data to various baseline models and um, just a simple relational event model without extra structure, lo and behold, um, the best models in terms of the held out likelihood are the ones with extra groups. So yeah, there does seem to be something in there and, and it does seem to, uh, to assist with performance. And so this is an example of how we can um, use these kinds of, uh, of techniques that now are possible thanks to um, the computational advances uh, that we have to, to, to really start to uncover this idea that's a very, very classic sort of social um, science question. <coughs> so modeling conversation is kind of tough, but um, there are tougher challenges out there. Um, and one of the uh, tougher kinds of challenges that uh, we tried to apply our um, ideas to is dealing with disaster. There's obviously a lot to be done um, uh, in a lot of different kinds of dimensions. So when disaster strikes, right, there are a lot of things we'd like to do. We'd like to be able to predict um, the impact of hazards on human populations, predict how they'll respond, predict the consequences of that, and then develop, of course, novel techniques for um, reducing loss of life and property. That's the sort of big picture. Um, of course, within that, there are a whole lot of details and a whole lot of, of, of deep research questions. And one area that in this uh, big arena that people have gotten increasingly interested in in the last um, decade or so has been um, social media. And that's both as a tool for studying um, interaction and communication at scale in a time-resolved way, which was something we did not have previously at all, but also um, as a platform for, um, for reaching the public. And so emergency management organizations are increasingly using social media as a way to get the word out when disaster strikes, as a way to find out what's happening, um, situational awareness and the like, which is really a sea change in, um, in how these things work. We've gone from a model where you, know, you communicate with the public by writing a press release or whatever, getting it passed to the public information officer who passes it to the media that passes it to the public, and this takes at least 30 minutes or longer, um, to something where someone's going to be on Twitter and pushing something out right away. And that has good and bad um, effects, but it's definitely a, a different kind of world. Um, so there are a lot of questions then about, well, what happens when organizations do this, if anything? Um, how does the public respond? And, and what are the key phenomena we need to know about in, in this sort of arena? 
Um, and so one of the things that we've looked at in that arena is, is phenomenon is called mass convergence. And so mass convergence is not a new thing. It's not something that's um, unique to the online world. Um, so here's an example from some work that we did um, some years ago on the uh, Hurricane Katrina disaster from 2005. So this map is showing um, the, obviously, the economy of the U.S. This uh, line here is the storm track from Katrina. Um, of course, it came in. It first hit Florida, which everyone forgets. Um, it, um, it went to the Gulf Coast. It sat there for a while building strength. And then, of course, it went up the Gulf Coast doing enormous damage to, um, to not only New Orleans, but to a lot of the surrounding area. Um, and each of these dots on the map is an emergency management organization that was involved in the response in the first 13 days following storm formation. And so as you can see, the organizations that got involved in this in that early phase not only are from the affected area, but they're really from everywhere, okay? All over the place, organizations stood up and, and mobilized and got involved. And I should mention, by the way, this is some work uh, that I did with now former students, uh, Chris Markham, now at NIH, and Ryan Acton, who's uh, now in the industry at Wedding Water. Um, so just to kind of emphasize what happens, right, um, when the storm kind of comes through, you get a uh, very rapid formation of response networks. So not only do you get huge numbers of organizations mobilizing, so each little dot here is an uh, organization that mobilizes, um, they, uh, they also begin to work with each other. So um, each little line down here in this emerging network is uh, collaboration. And so you go from about 30 organizations um, being involved when the, the tropical storm Katrina is first named to within um, a few days following landfall in Louisiana, um, about 770 organizations being active with over uh, 1,600 or uh, over 1,500 being involved over this, uh, over this time period. So it's an enormous undertaking. Huge, huge numbers of organizations from all over suddenly converging on this disaster and, and trying to work together to solve problems. Okay, and that's something that occurs then in the online as world as well, but it can occur much faster and something we wanted to understand. So um, uh, we, my group has looked at that in conjunction with um, uh, a part of a project called Heroic, uh, in conjunction with Jeanette Sutton, my collaborator at the University of Kentucky, and then these are uh, some of our uh, students and now former students um, who've worked on, uh, on what I'm gonna show you today. Um, so one of the basic questions that we might ask is, okay, if you have this notion of mass convergence, do you have online, what would it might it look like? And one of the things that, uh, that we might expect to see is that when a disaster hits an area, you get a convergence of attention. Okay, people start paying attention to what's going on in that, uh, in that area and uh, in ways that they didn't before. And indeed, that's something that we see. So one really simple thing we can think of to look at is just if we take organizations that are involved in an event and we look at just how many, say, Twitter followers they have, okay, which is sort of one measure of how many people are they're subscribing to the things they, they push out, um, we can see that, um, that this often changes quite radically. Um, and so these are proportion changes in follower counts for two events. This is the Waldo Canyon fire in Colorado. This is Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we can see, again, really quite massive growth in many cases. Um, sometimes here, you know, say six-fold growth in the follower counts uh, for organizations that are active in that response. Uh, now, which organizations are seeing those big changes can vary. So in the case of, say, Waldo Canyon, we primarily see local and then secondarily state organizations as being the ones that have the big jump. In the case of Hurricane Sandy, it's primarily the regional ones. And this seems to have something to do with the, um, the scale and the nature of the event. If it's a local event, okay, people are tuning into the local orgs that, like, say, the city of Colorado Springs. This was in the Colorado Springs area. Their fire department and the like that know what's going on. In other cases, um, if it's a more regional event, you've got people, you've got organizations that have a regional focus that are playing a key role. Okay, and so this is a simple enough observation, but it's pretty important because uh, we see that these changes can occur very fast. So one implication of this for practice is that if you're a, a PIO, it's a, even a small organization that maybe today no one pays attention to you and no one has any followers and your boss is like, why do we have to use this Twitter thing? Like, I, I don't want to be a twit, um, you know, why are we... No one's listening to us, no one cares. Well, that can go from no one cares to the whole world is watching you and that can happen within hours. So you can't at that time say, hey, wait, we need a social media strategy. What are we doing? Okay, it's too late. When the thunderclap strikes, no time to cover the ears. So um, you, uh, you have to be ready and that's certainly something that we see. So follower count is sort of one uh, measure of, of convergence of attention. Of course, another thing is simply just the um, conversation volume itself. Um, and so one question we had is, okay, who is really talking about, uh, about these events when they strike? 
And we know, of course, many of the people discussing disasters are not the people who are themselves at risk or at ground zero, right? Conversation spreads quite widely. So when a tornado breaks out and people start talking about it, it's not just going to be the people at the scene who are doing it. And that's something that you know, we know from decades of disaster research, uh, but we can't normally see it very clearly because there's no way to measure conventionally people just having a conversation about what's happened. But in the online world, we can often see that. So we can actually measure this and, and start to probe what's going on. And so one of our conjectures was that you would see hazard-related communication on a topic like, say, tornado getting amplified among people or among populations that have more ties to the impacted area, right? If, um, if I or the people around me have, um, you know, tie friends, family, and so forth in an area and it gets hit by, say, a tornado, that's going to make more of an impact on me than if it's, well, you know, people I don't know getting hit, that's too bad, but whatever. Um, so, of course, what we'd ideally like to do is we'd like to directly probe that by looking at people's network ties and their ties to the affected area and how they respond, but, well, that's hard to do because we can't exactly prospectively measure all of the friendship ties and uh, family ties and whatnot in the whole U.S., at least not currently, not with the budget I'm able to get. You know, if you want to give me that money, though, give me an email and, you know, I'm happy to do it. But we can try to uh, approximate it by using spatial network models to predict how many ties there would be between people in different areas and the target and see whether or not this predicts um, communication. Um, and so this is something that Sean Fitzhugh, now former student at Army Research Lab, um, and I um, did some work on. And so to do this, we of course first have to try to predict what, um, uh, what the tie volumes between different areas in the country would be. And so to do this, we uh, dug out a, a framework that I've done a fair amount with over the years, um, these sort of simple families of spatial Bernoulli graphs. So this is a, a, a very scalable family of models for spatially embedded social networks. The basic idea is that we treat every tie in the network as independent, which is obviously an approximation given um, distance, but we allow the probability of a tie to be a fairly complex function of distance. And um, this, of course, is uh, which we empirically estimate um, in other work. Um, and so this is um, uh, this is something that's actually closely related to the gravity models. If those of you who are in spatial econometrics or uh, geography will have heard of these before. Um, and so in the gravity models, the expectation of interaction between two points is proportional to a product of a pair of potential for those points and an impedance or interaction function. So there's a similar kind of idea. There's a spatial interaction function that represents the marginal probability of a tie with distance. Um, and so um, here, of course, what we, uh, how then, how do we use this idea to simulate networks at scale? Well, we start with GIS data on populations in space, so we're using block level uh, information from the census, um, and then uh, we can, um, of course, given that, draw individual positions for a point process um, and draw the Bernoulli graph given those um, uh, positions, and then we've, uh, we're using some SIs we've fitted from some other uh, data. And there are tricks you need to do to do this well, but, but anyway, that's... Uh, um, one can do it. If you do that, what are these networks like? Here's just uh, some examples. So this is from some work I did with John Hip and Nick Nagel and Ryan Acton. Um, so this is an example. We modeled um, a place that probably none of you have been to called Cookville, Tennessee. Okay, um, it's a, a, a metropolitan statistical area in Tennessee. Here I've I've, coded, I, I've I've shown the block structure in Tennessee from the census. Every point here is an individual, and then this shadowy stuff. These is these are networks. These are the ties, and so. We can just get a sense of how much heterogeneity there is in these structures. And this is all actually arising out of just spatial geography. So that alone actually gives you very um, a complex network structure as we find we sort of zoom in on it. Um, here we're zooming in on one place, this interesting block that is this sort of huge volume of people. If you go to Google Earth and you look around and you see what's going on there, this is a bunch of dorms actually on a college campus. So we were pleased that uh, we, didn't, we didn't know that. We modeled it obviously, but nevertheless, it seems to work. So is this going to then predict? So I mean, it's it's a it's a pretty ambitious thing, right? We didn't fit this model to the data alone. We have this other data on this, and we say if we have this model, this very simple model network structure, is it going to be associated at all with Twitter response? So here's an example. This is the Moore tornado in Oklahoma. Um, here's ground zero where the tornado hits, um, and here are for every county in Oklahoma um, uh, the tie volumes that we would expect to see with that uh, that ground zero area. And then I've also shaded the counties by the relative enhancement um, uh, relative to baseline in, in Twitter conversation during the day of the uh, following the tornado on, on the term tornado. And it, it kind of looks like there's an effect. If you analyze statistically, there is an effect. And so that suggested to us that uh, maybe something was going on. So we did this a little more systematically. 
Uh, we analyzed Twitter traffic volume in response to um, the, all the fatal storms during the 2013 season. Uh, we're using here the traffic on the uh, keyword tornado. Um, and for right now, we're looking at the um, geocoded subset um, by county. Um, and we did this in two periods. The first 24 hours um, from the storm touchdown and then that we call the secondary period, which is the next 24 hours. Um, and the question is if we control for lots of things, like say how many warnings are issued, um, how many prior tornado events that area has experienced before, the uh, estimated storm impacts, um, the um, um, thing, inter intermigration rates between the two areas, the um, uh, demographics of people in the area, whether it's rural or not, the population, so forth. Do we still see an effect for tie volume? Um, and it turns out that yes, otherwise, you know, would we be looking at it now? Um, there it is. There's a fairly large impact of tie volume, a net of everything else on communication. So the counties that are predicted to have more interaction um, with the target area seem to show a larger response than of everything else. That's the first 24 hours. What about the next 24 hours? Even if we control for the first 24 hour uh, reaction, there still is some. So this suggests that there really is some um, impact of the average individual ties to the uh, tornado affected county and, and the, um, the amount of response that we get. Um, and so this again gives us some insight into this um, uh, this process when disaster strikes, okay, people mobilize, it's not everywhere, everyone everywhere, it's going to be particularly people affected. There are a lot of other interesting things that, uh, that uh, one can do in terms of understanding um, the uh, attention paid to messages. So one other thing I'll just briefly mention, we've done, we've done some work looking at when official organizations put messages out there, what affects the rate at which they get retransmitted. And of course, one can think about things like, well, how many uh, followers does the organization have? Of course, that's a huge effect um, and other such things. But the content matters too. So this is just a shout out to people who still care about reading things and looking at the content of messages. Uh, it turns out, you know, it makes a difference what you say. Um, and so this is from um, some work, uh, again, with Jeanette Sutton's group, um, where we, um, this is a piece from a larger model. We looked at how different kinds of tweet content affected the tendency for that to be passed on in a number of different um, events, so a terrorist attack, wildfire, hurricane, flood, and blizzard. And we do see that although there's a lot of differences from one event to another, there are some overall pretty strong trends. So things like hazard impact information tends to be pretty important in enhancing uh, retweets where just you know, thanking people and things like that seem not to matter um, quite so much. And so this gives some guidance to the people who are writing these things about what things they might do that might, might make a difference. Okay, so that's a bit on social media. And then in my last few minutes, I want to change gears a bit and talk about another of these kind of cool frontier areas where I think there's great stuff to be done. Um, and this is uh, sort of under the broad theme of trying to make use of ever bigger availability of data, right? So there are a lot of fields where data is accumulating at a rate that's so fast we can't even really make use of it. And of course, a classic example of a place where this is happening is in um, data on um, uh, genomic transcriptome data, so data on uh, gene sequences. Uh, we know that out there in that giant mass of data are huge numbers of enzymes that are a potential uh, use for therapeutic or, um, or bio, uh, uh, biotechnology applications. But the problem is the amount of stuff that's out there is huge, okay? So the NCBI uh, database, for instance, that the base count, is how, many, how much stuff is in their uh, thing, it doubles about every 18 months. So this is the growth in gene bank. This is the shotgun sequencing bank. You can look at like how many base pairs of stuff are in there. So we're at like, you know, one times 10 to the 12th. Okay, huge amounts of stuff are in there. If you just look at Uniprot, which is a collection of protein, um, uh, proteins that have been identified um, putatively or, or from, uh, from uh, experimental data, it has, you know, right now, it's about um, 6.8 times 10 to the 7th, so about tens, millions, tens of millions of entries um, of, uh, of proteins, okay, that are out there. So out of, in all of that giant garbage can of stuff, a lot of it's probably not so useful, um, but some of this is stuff that's potentially really valuable. But where are you gonna find it, right? So you go out and make all this stuff in the lab, but A, you need a lab, B, that's difficult, right? If you wanna boot up a new protein, okay, to experimentally express it, um, it's, it's a lot cheaper than it used to be, but it's still now about one to $4,000 per system. And that's assuming it works, because you might pick your protein and try to express it, and the E. coli won't make it, 
and then you try to get yeast to make it, and yeast won't make it, and so then you have like you know guinea pig cells, and the guinea pigs won't make it, and you've now blown through like hundred thousand dollars, and you know your vending agencies are pounding on your door, and you don't have your uh, your your final report ready, and it's looking kind of ugly. Okay, so it's it's not an easy problem. And so, for instance, if you were to say, well, what if even under this optimistic scenario, what if you wanted to mate everything in Uniprot to study it experimentally? Well, it would cost upwards of 170 billion dollars in growing. Okay, so we don't have that much money. That means that what we need to do is find out how to pick good candidates to look at in that huge volume of data. So we would like to leverage computational methods to go from the genomic source code, if you will, to useful biomolecules with less experimental input. You still have to check things at the end of the day, but if you can have a smaller subset of things to check, you can go a long way. And so this is um, some work that I've been doing with, um, primarily with Rachel Martin's group at UCI, a number of folks um, involved in that. And what we've been working on is sort of working toward trying to, um, trying to build what we call a protein compiler pipeline. Okay, so the idea is that we begin with, of course, raw DNA or RNA. Um, you assemble that into a genome or transcriptome. You discover the genes. You identify targets. You annotate the key features that are necessary to make that to a mature enzyme. Predict the structure, equilibrate the structure, analyze it, and then hopefully validate it. Okay, and so there's a whole lot of pieces, parts here. And in doing this, we're using, uh, we're building on a lot of tool chains that have been built by a lot of folks. But that's one of the great things that we can do currently because there are, there's been a huge revolution in each of these areas at building pieces of the puzzle. What there's been less of doing is sort of putting all these pieces together and really trying to, uh, to use it. And that's one of the things we're trying to do. So um, the application that we've been primarily focused on is um, trying to pry useful proteins from the tentacles of a carnivore, specifically a carnivorous plant. Okay, so here we made the structure of proteins, which is actually a lot of fun. Um, this, is, um, this is our photo, from our, this is our, uh, one of our plants. This is Drosera capensis, the Cape sundew. It's a carnivorous plant, it eats bugs. Um, it traps them in a mucilage. Uh, it's a carbohydrate-based uh, mucilage, and then once it traps them, it secretes digestive enzymes and eats them. Um, and so we sequenced the genome of this, um, and we uh, published a high-quality draft genome. So it covers about 90%. It was the first, first carnivorous plant genome in the order Caryophyllales. Um, we did it all with luminar reads because we had no money for it, but uh, we still got pretty good assembly out of all of that. Now, why carnivorous plants, other than that they're cool and I like to grow them, okay? And the answer is that carnivorous plants have a really hard time eating stuff. Like, you probably never thought about the tasks involved in eating and digesting your food. Hopefully, you don't think about it too much, maybe especially not while eating. Um, but you have a lot of things that your body has going for it when it wants to, you know, bite into a steak or something and eat it. First of all, you can masticate the food. You can chew it up, okay? And I, I encourage you to do that. Um, then when you swallow it, it gets dropped in a big vat of acid, okay, that's kept at high temperature. And in that isolated vat of acid at high temperature, it gets churned up, okay, and all kinds of enzymes can do their thing. And enzymes like to do their thing at high temperature, and it's isolated, so you don't have to worry about, say, a slug coming and eating the steak out from under you, okay, or even fungi or bacteria for the most part. So you have it easy, okay, as an animal. This plant, this plant... It has a hard life, right? So it catches, say, a fly on its tentacles, and it wants to eat it. Well, it can't chew it up, okay? It can't, and it can't put it at high temperature. So these enzymes have to eat the plant for just whole with no chewing. It's got to do it out there in ambient temperature in the environment, and it's an environment where it has to then compete with bacteria and fungi and uh, macroscopic organisms that would like it to eat, it, literally eat its lunch. Okay, and so the only way you're going to do that is if you have great chemistry, right? You've got to have enzymes, digestive enzymes that get there, take that whole organism and break it down so that you can um, obtain the valuable nutrients that you get from it, which in the case of the plants, you might think it's energy. It's actually not energy. It's primarily um, things like nitrogen and phosphorus and, and, uh, and other fun stuff that it's getting out of it. So we're interested then in getting at these enzymes that may be really useful um, digestive enzymes for, for, uh, for uh, biotechnical applications of various kinds. Um, and so what we did is we took our genome, we extracted this, we had a whole pipeline to do that, um, and then we subjected these things to structural modeling um, using um, a Rosetta, and then once we did that, we, uh, we did what we call in silico maturation, where we modify those initial structures to, um, to make them look like the, the mature enzyme, which involves nipping and tucking things and changing protonation states and the like. Uh, we then equilibrate it using atomistic molecular dynamics um, so we put it in virtual water, we let the thing virtually equilibrate, um, and then we can analyze these structures and try to get some insights. 
Um, and so there are a number of nice things we could do. So these are examples of some of the proteins that we found. Um, this is a Drosaris, and this actually, we pulled this out of the transcriptome of, a, of the Venus flytrap, uh, but we modeled that one too. Um, and once we have these thin structural models, we can begin to inspect them, and we can do things like um, we can make sure that we have a mature version of the enzyme. Um, and in fact, we were able to find by doing this some errors in Uniprot, so things, guesses people had made about where, for which parts of the enzyme get cut off. Um, if you structurally look at it, you can tell that those sequence-based predictions are not right because, for instance, they would leave the active site blocked so it can't do any chemistry. Um, so we're able to improve on some of that structurally. Um, we can make sure that the, ends, the active sites are oriented the right way for function um, and, uh, and things like that. And we also can discover some other cool things. So, for instance, one of the things that we found in our aspartic proteases is something called plant-specific insert. It's, um, it's a, a lot like something called hesapacin. Um, it's an antifungal, and it sets enzyme within an enzyme. So this thing makes two enzymes, one gets cut off, and then goes off and does its business. And it attacks fungi that might compete with the plant. Um, before we did this, as far as we know, there were four previously known um, uh, uh, PSIs, uh, one from the, the potato, one from barley, one from the cardoon. We found eight just in our plant alone using this technique. Um, so we're really able to find a lot of these potentially useful antifungals, uh, which is a cool thing. But we can go further, um, right? Having found these structures, we can start probing the structures to identify what kinds of things might be useful functional different differences. So if you're only going to make a few of them in the lab, you'd like to make ones that do different things. Um, and so in the case of the pro some of the proteases that we've uh, found, we've used structural modeling to try to predict differences in cut site affinity. And so we did this using docking methods. So we came up with sort of a, um, a, a sort of Boltzmann-like model that we applied to predict where these different proteases like to cut when they cut the backbone of protea uh, proteins. Um, and so um, we came up with a model that seems to do that pretty well. And if we cluster the um, aspartic proteases by their differences in what they like to cut, what they like to eat, um, as opposed to their sequence similarity, you see actually there are quite a lot of differences. And so this is kind of the map that if you use traditional bioinformatic methods, you might use to figure out what's similar to make something. But this is much more the map you want to use, right? So which things seem to behave in different ways. And this is something that we can get at using this kind of toolkit to guide, um, to guide um, uh, experimentation. Uh, another thing we've been doing is trying to find um, clever ways to use networks to um, simplify the study of protein structures. Because they're, let's face it, they're big and complicated and I think kind of ugly, although the protein people disagree with me on that. Whereas networks are, are beautiful and elegant and also I like networks. So the question is, can we do something with that? And so we've been adapting uh, an idea that comes from Benson Daggett. They came up with a scheme for representing um, different chemical groups by nodes and building networks out of them. And so we've been kind of drawing on that uh, framework. So these are, this is a polypeptide chain. These are different chemical groups. And then the circled ones are the ones that they group together um, as, uh, as distinct um, nodes. And given that, and given a protein structure, we can actually now make a network that encodes that protein structure in a more parsimonious way. Um, and so this gives us a lot of insight into which regions of the protein are likely to be cohesively connected, which things are going to be thermally stable, for instance. Um, it also gives us other ways to classify proteins um, and identify differences in, in structures. These are examples of some chitinases um, that we, uh, we studied from, uh, from the capensis. Um, we can see here these are um, family 18, these are family 19 um, uh, chitinases. And they, they have really, when you look at them from a network analytic standpoint, they have radical differences in structure that are immediately apparent. Um, and not just can we see the macro structure, but we actually are also able to find things about the, the local environment around um, residues that gives us some insight into how, for instance, things might unfold. Um, another thing we can do with networks, we can compare them. And this gives us an, a yet another way to, um, to identify potential targets. And so here, um, what we did was we took, um, the, uh, uh, we took 44 cysteine proteases and 44 proteins to study computation is a lot, as it turns out, um, from our plant. Um, and uh, what we did was we converted them into protein structure networks. Um, and then we used um, a technique for comparing networks that was originally developed for things like comparing life histories, actually, and used this to, um, to do scaling. So we were actually able to identify sets of proteins that are relatively similar or relatively distinct structurally in terms of the topology. Okay? And that allows us to get rid of degrees of freedom we don't care about, like which way is this methyl group pointing at the particular moment you snapshot of the thing, okay? and get at things that are likely to be a bit more robust. Um, and one of the things we found in this set of proteases, they actually sort of have this very clean um, kind of uh, 
um, uh, tri triangular structure, if you like. So they're really kind of three distinct kind of dimensions on which they tend to vary. And so if you're going to make in the lab, um, you know, say four of these things, it suggests if you want to get things that are maximally different, you can get take the points on the ends and the point in the middle and, uh, and maximize your chance of getting uh, things that, that, uh, that have, have, uh, really do have different structure. So these are all different examples of uh, ways that we can use and ways that our group has been using um, computationally uh, uh, enabled techniques, um, computational statistics, bioinformatics, the like, um, to sort of probe complex, um, complex system questions. Um, and I think that there's a lot more, obviously, to be done in this arena. Um, there are a lot of exciting uh, directions, I think, in terms of um, more empirically grounded statistical models for complex systems using um, the kind of data uh, uh, infrastructure that we have to accumulate more uh, data and mine these out of it and so forth. And I think particularly the opportunities of the interface with biology, which is really the, the current and next big scientific revolution, are enormous. Um, and of course the social sciences, right, where I originally come from, which I would think of as the revolution after next, okay, uh, where there's going to be a lot of great stuff happening. Uh, it's hard to predict exactly where data science is going to be in 10 to 12, 20 years, as you all know, it's a really rapidly changing area. Uh, but I think the prospects are bright and there's um, a huge amount um, to be done. With that, I will close by again recognizing my group um, and uh, particularly and collaborators and particularly folks did stuff I highlighted today. So Maruna, Rebbe, Chris, and Ryan, and Emma, former members, um, also the um, current folks in there and, and my, my collaborators in the Smith Lab, the Sutton Lab, and the Martin Lab. Um, and with that, I thank all of you for uh, your attention and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, so, in, um, in your analysis of the Hurricane Katrina um, thing, you, you focused on the uh, emergency response teams and on the, you did, I believe, the Twitter uh, activity of Hurricane Katrina as well, or was that sort of like Well, there wouldn't have been significant hurricane, or uh, Twitter activity in Hurricane Katrina. Um, given when that happened. So no, that was all done. Um, I'll bring that up. That, that information all came from documents. So what we uh, did with Hurricane Katrina was we analyzed situation reports. So these were sit reps issued by organizations that were responding to the event. They're like little kind of newspapers, if you like, that say who's doing what and what's active and what's happening and so forth. And these things were manually coded for every organization that was mentioned that was uh, potentially active in the response and all of the collaboration. And so it took, to get to what you're seeing here, it took about a year of manual coding, um, uh, primarily by, is my picture gonna come up? Let's stall for a minute. Okay, well anyway, the folks that I was going to show that are uh, up there, anyway, they did the, did the hard work to code those transcripts. So yeah, that was not, uh, that was not online, that was all off offline stuff. So you um, given much thought as to Oh yeah, well, and there, so there are several different things. So I mentioned briefly a few of the things we've learned from the social media work, um, and we're actually um, we're actually doing a lot of stuff. We're, we're working right now with the National Weather Service, and um, we've done some stuff. Our, some of our stuff is we've written up has been used by the EPA in their training, but we're we're doing a lot of stuff there, looking at what we've how we can apply what we've learned to the kind of practices that PIOs, public information officers, need to use when they want to communicate with people if they want to get things passed on. Um, as far as Katrina, um, that, that is a hideously complicated event, um, and I think there are a lot of things that came out of it. Um, one little example of a thing that's, uh, that was really apparent in, in our analysis of the Hurricane Katrina response is how much of that emergent network is really dominated, especially in those early days, by organizations that we, you would not normally expect or plan for to be active at the scene. So for instance, um, one of the big collections of organizations that rapidly mobilizes and becomes key in that first you know, week after landfall in, in Louisiana, um, uh, one of the big groups is, is led by Colorado organizations. Um, and you know, you can see that Colorado is not especially close to the storm track. Um, you know, why is Colorado so key in this thing? Well, one, they're not hit. So the very fact that they're not there actually gives them an advantage. 
But also, it turned out that the Colorado Department of Emergency Management and some of the other organizations had a bunch of people who had been before in the Gulf Coast area. They had experience with hurricanes. Um, and when disaster strikes, people start calling around, they call people they know. Um, and so there was sort of a chain migration, if you look at the data, of Colorado organizations getting in and bringing in other organizations and so forth that they mobilized and formed a huge part of that response. So this undergirds, and this isn't, at some level it's not super shocking in the sense that if you read the disaster research literature again and again, you'll see that the emphasis that what happens is hard to predict in advance and you have to be adaptive and ready for different groups to come in or out that you might not have expected. Nevertheless, you keep having to tell people this because you know planners always want to think that they can know exactly who, what org and who's going to come in and they're going to they're going to set everything up and that was a problem in Katrina. So one of the things that happened, um, a little example of where this went wrong at a more small scale, um, you had a, a, a huge group of people who showed up in boats, the Cajun Navy as they were being called at the time, to rescue people, people who were stranded on the roofs of their houses. So when the flooding hit after the storm. A lot of them were trapped you know, out there in their homes. The people were sitting on their roofs. People needed to get out there to bring them out. And um, a whole flotilla of people who were trying to go help were actually stopped by Louisiana authorities. Um, I think it was like the fish and game people. But they didn't, I mean, because basically they were afraid to let people go out and do this stuff because they were concerned they were going to get blamed if people got injured. And they didn't have any authorization from uh, higher ups to let anyone do it. And DHS had, which of course was a new, or, new organization at that time, it kind of clamped down on everything, but had not then allowed uh, groups under it, to, they had not given any direction to them of what to do. And so what wound up happening was you have people who on the ground are ready to act, people won't let them act because it's not part of the plan, they're not the ones supposed to be doing it, they don't have authorization, you can't get authorization because everything is flattened, and also some of the people in charge didn't know what they were doing. And this is one of the kinds of um, problems that arose in, in that event. Um, if you design for, if you know, you study the past events and you design for improvisation, you design for change, you design that, okay, I know people are gonna show up, but I don't know who it's gonna be. And you, need a, you have an adaptive set of organizational practices to allow that to occur. You can be more flexible, but that was not what the folks in charge thought was going to happen. And the results in some cases were fatal. So some examples. Okay, one more, and then I'm happy to answer questions after if people have them. Uh, so if we go to, uh, you, you had a, a discussion of, of the interactions between the individuals and how mm -hmm. the, the way they interact can allow you to understand how uh, different groups of people more than, say, a stochastic spot from one group. Mm -hmm. uh, when, what I, you were mentioning was that when you zoomed in on a particular group of people, you saw there's like a certain homogenous group. But you didn't. I, did you say what those what those homogenous groups were? What, what they represented? Yeah, we don't. We don't know. Is a sort of simple answer to that. This data, the data we have access oh, to here, right. is unfortunately not very rich and does not give us all the depth. We we don't have the original emails and, and other information. So yeah, we don't know who those were. Um, you could certainly find out in the, if you had the original data. And, you know, and so, so this is sort of proof of principle to show that you, know, you can find these things that are out there. We know that they're there in the sense that there are groups and they interact differently. Um, what you would then like to be able to do having discovered them is to go back and try to figure out, okay, can you, do they correspond to institutionalized groups? Yeah. Now, one of the things that's interesting, right, is that they might and they might not. So yeah. you might discover that actually there is no institutional label and nevertheless, these groups are very different and you might discover them that way. But in other cases, you might discover there is an institutional label, and then that might tell you, okay, what kinds of covariates you might include in future modeling. And, um, I think one of the valuable things you can do with sort of latent structure models is actually use them as an exploratory device to figure out what measurable manifest variables you can, you can best use in your future analysis and future yeah. modeling. And I think that because, I mean, there are a lot of challenges and limitations of latent structure models. But yeah. And presumably it's a way of figuring out uh, what, what are the that's right, that's potentially the case. And you might find, so you might start out with groups that you think are gonna be homogeneous. They might turn out actually to be, to be quite, uh, quite distinct. So that's an, another kind of level analysis you could, you could use after the fact. You could also build, of course, those covariates into the hierarchical structure if you knew they were there in advance. So we didn't have that information in, in that particular case. Um, and yes, indeed, that's sort of one of the first questions I asked. I'm like, well, so are these staff members and faculty, or, you know, who are they? Are these grad students, and pre you know? You have all kinds of guesses, but in this case, we, we don't happen to know. But you could do that if you had the data.
All right. Thanks to all of you.